Hey, welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction, but more importantly, it's about recovery. And it's brought to you from our friends at useonlyasdirected.org. They got a three part solution for the opioid epidemic it is speak out, opt out, and of course, throw out. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt. How hey, are you? I'm good. Man, your hair's looking good. Yeah? Do you like it? I, I'm really it's liking the COVID it. COVID, dude. No, no cutting. And so, how long have you been growing your locks? I, I don't think I've had a hair I, In the last year i've probably had two haircuts what is the trims what does the girlfriend think well see see that's the problem i don't know because she's so kind and supportive and 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 loves me i i I don't really know if she likes the hair but but she doesn't seem to mind it do you like it most of the time it's kind of a hassle but i i don't know i i have a whole history of hating getting haircuts when i was a kid and and never really so i'm just letting it go so we want to talk about that because i don't think you probably go see a therapist let me be your therapist (laughs) what don't you like about haircuts well, yeah, it's you, it's giving up control. You feel insecure. You never know what you're going to look like when you're done. Mm-hmm. Dad always wants the buzz cut when you're a kid. High and tight. High, High and tight. tight. Never wanted. That wasn't cool in the 70s. No. You didn't want to be that kid, right? And uh, so I think it kind of rolled over into adult life that I never really uh, – liked getting haircuts. So I'm just letting it go now. I think I'm similar to you because last night I was standing in my girlfriend's bathroom as she was taking a comb and combing out my eyebrows so she could get the wild ones and make it look a little more tamed. Yeah, we're and, at that age, man. And I was like, man, I don't want to do this. And that'll just- happen overnight. One day you look fine, and the next day you look like you know Edward Rooney or somebody like Every that. Every once in a while I'm driving down the road and I look in my rearview mirror and I see a nose hair poking out. And I'm yeah, like, that thing that? is long. <laughs> How did that all of a sudden that happens just, in hours? Just It'll pop just, out, boom! So I do what I normally do. I take my fingernails and I pull it. Right. My eyes get a little watery. I roll down the window and I try to flick it out. Inevitably, it flows. Back. Of course, it comes right back. In. Yeah. So don't eat off my floor in my car because it's probably got nose hair on oh, it. Oh, thanks for the for the. I want to talk about something. I want to talk about your shirt today. The pink flamingos. <laughs> I mean, I I don't think everybody. Could pull that shirt off. I, I couldn't pull off. It's a it's a beautiful blue with just covered in pink flamingos. So my buddy Kaleo, uh, he invites me to his uh, club to do a golf tournament every year, uh-huh. and he thought it'd be cool if we had matching outfits. <laughs> and so He's every one year, of those friends, huh? yeah, every year we have matching outfits, uh-huh. and so this was just one of them. This was, <laughs> and uh, I, I looked in the closet this morning, and it looked at me, and I looked at it, and I went. Yep, I'm going to do it. Yeah, you look like you're going on vacation. I'm ready for a vacation, man. I only got 68 more days to blow. Yeah, you're coming up on it, right? And I think we should talk about it because I think sometimes I feel like everybody's on the same page as me. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be sitting around at a family party or I'll be at work or whatever it is. And I'll go, hey, I got to go blow. (laughs) And three people go. Oh, makes sense. And then the other five are like, what does that mean? What does he do? Go yeah. And so every day I have to drive down to the jail in Ogden, the Kiesel Center, mm-hmm. in between 6.30 and 8.30 in the morning and blow. And what every- happens if you're late? Ooh, you're not. You're getting in trouble. Yeah. Have you ever been late? Never been late. I did miss one day. When, almost. <laughs> and I showed up two hours late and I could have ended up eight hours in jail. So here's the Whoa. deal. Here's the program. So you blow for a year. You get your license, and you're able to work and do this. But you have so to it's go, a breathalyzer test. A breathalyzer. 6.30 yeah. and 8.30 in the morning, 6.30 and 8.30 at night. You show up once, and you've got alcohol in your breath. You're spending eight hours in jail. They just pull you right here, in. Here you go. Okay. Here's your hot and a cot. Here you go. Let's do this. Uh, second time, it's 12 hours. Third time, it's 24 hours. The fourth time, they kick you out, and you're back in jail. Oh, you go back to jail. You go back in jail. Do you lose your license if yep. you if you blow uh, dirty once? I don't know. I've never blown dirty. Okay. As a matter of fact, I've never seen anybody in the program blow dirty. Really? Pound for pound, I think it's the best recovery. Why does it work? What, what's, a, what's it about it? It holds you accountable. Mm-hmm. It makes you feel human, and you're able to live your life. It's a I pain would... in the butt. Well, yeah, but not as much as you asking bumming, your girlfriend for a ride or calling Uber or, yeah. or making our poor guests take you home. And our guest is Michael B, and he's from Utah County. He wasn't going to drive the wrong up, way. He wasn't going to drive up to Farmington to uh, pick me up. I'm from right? Draper. No, he's from Draper. 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 So it's so it, it, it's a good thing. So I need to tell because I was sending a text to our boss here, and I said, uh, "Can I call you before or after I blow?" And all she sent back was question marks. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, "Well, I, I, let me clarify that. My kids all know what it means. I have yeah, to go yeah, down yeah. and blow for my license." And yeah. so, 
But it's well, been 68 more days. You've been really consistent, and you're almost there. Yeah. yeah. Hey, our guest today is Michael B. Michael Birkland. Did I say that right? Yeah, that's close enough. Birkland. But, but, listen, we're not in the old country of Norway, so Birkland is... The Norwegian way to say it, Scandi. <laughs> I love that. And you can see he's already on. He's one of my oldest friends. We actually started in the industry together probably 20, 25 years ago. Yeah. And you might know him from Singles Ward, RN, Home Teachers. Not RN. RN. That, that's R-N. nursing. RM. 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 Return to yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh. I think that makes single. the movie make sense now. <laughs> yeah. I was like, these guys aren't even nurses. 20 years you've been thinking, like, where are the nurses in this film? It's the dumbest film I've ever seen. To be honest, nurse. I've only seen the two that I was in, and that was Singles Ward <laughs> and Church, Church Ball. Ball yeah. Well, Michael kind of single-handedly, like, introduced us to to that genre of film, right? The more the Mormon <laughs> comedy. <laughs> Single handedly. <laughs> Single handedly. No, the there actors, was. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, our group, yeah. For Kurt sure. Hale. Kurt, Dave, Hunter. Yeah. Yeah. And so tell me how this all started Moyer. with, with the LDS movies. Uh, okay, so uh, John Moyer had, he's the writer of the, the first uh, few films, had this idea, and I believe it was called Redeeming LA. It's a great, great script. And, uh, and they're like, yeah, let's make this movie. Kurt's going to go stop working for his uh, father in law. Who owns Pride in England Trucking? He has this great job. Dave's going to stop, you know, doing his land development, and they're going to make a movie. And they go into it a few months, like eh, this is not going to work. And then one day, John, if I remember correctly, John tells Kurt, "Why don't you do my life story?" Well, why would we do your life story? Well, I'm a comedian, but I was married, return missionary, married in the temple. I came home one day, and my ex-wife was drinking and smoking. Like I can't do this anymore, and I had to go back into a singles ward. And they thought it was a hilarious idea. It's a good idea. And uh, so then at that point, they kind of switched gears. And it was the first comedy. So, and then while ranking the film, I said, listen, I want to help you guys push this movie out. I've never done this before, but neither of you. So let's figure it out. Let's, it, it can't be that hard. And there's some groups who didn't want to work with it because we know their distribution deals are really bad. So as we start going out, the first theater we went into was the Carmack Wind song in Provo. No one was going. Everyone thought it was an anti-Mormon film because no, no one had made a comedy before since the phone call. And that was a short film, B- BYU. So a uh, FAG group came in on uh, Monday from BYU. And this is back before Facebook. This is email time. And they're like, oh, my gosh, and started emailing everybody. And the theater company just said, if you can't get people to come, we've got to take it out. It's just the one theater. And from that day, and I believe for about five months, there wasn't one showing at that theater that wasn't sold out. And then that's what really kind of started. They're all going, oh, my gosh, it's, we're making fun of our culture. It's not... It's not an anti-Mormon movie. So yeah. I was actually in Singles Ward, and I just had a little guest spot. A big I, spot. A big guest spot. I was talking with Scotty Christopher. Mm-hmm. We were at a Singles Ward dance. Me and him were sitting on the on the bench. A girl walks by. We look at her, and uh, Scotty Christopher says, hey, you know, what are you doing? And he goes, well, you got you to see their mom because that's what they're going to end up looking like. And I said, your mom's here or something like that. But the crazy thing is. Back in my early days of acting, before I went to any auditions or anything like that, I'd always have two beers because it would calm my nerves. And uh, so I would do that. So I was going up to do Singles Ward. I was nervous. This is my first movie. And uh, I was getting driven up there, and I thought I was just going to have two beers. I didn't know where Heber was. So by the time <laughs> I got there, I had six beers. <laughs> and they were filming in a church. <laughs> and I walked yeah. into the church, and I remember talking to Kurt, the director, and I go, I'm here for my job. And he goes, have you been drinking? <laughs> <laughs> and I go, yeah. You wanted to make it like a real singles war. Yeah, so. but the, no, yeah, so <laughs> I said, yeah. And he goes, do me a favor. Go stand over here and do not talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, okay. So I go stand over there, and they go, let's hurry and get him out of here because he's got alcohol in his breath. We're in a church. Really? This is not good. And that's yeah, that's yeah. in my head. That's what I was thinking was going on. I didn't know how movies worked, and they were just waiting for my scene. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. then I came down, and I sat down, and I did my line. And then I walked out and got in the car, and we came home. And I was like, I think I was just drunk doing an LDS movie movie. <laughs> this is not a good – this is not good. But I kept that maintaining, and I always did two beers before. And then two beers became four and all that yeah. stuff. And so, I mean, that was my first experience in movies. And really? It was, yeah, it was kind of crazy. And then those blew up, and we did Church Ball, then Stalking Santa. And, yeah. you know, I mean, it was – but for a while, that was the hot stuff. But I remember me and you would always talk 
off mic and off camera, and we'd always have just a good time. And I didn't know you were battling substance, and you didn't know I was battling substance. So let's get into your story. When did the substance abuse start to take hold for you? Um, it was probably 1996. In fact, I tried to pinpoint it. it was right around uh, 95 and 96. And uh, I was uh, married to my first wife, and we had a couple of kids already. And um, and we had kids way earlier than I thought. And that really stressed me out because we were planning on graduate college, blah, 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 and then having kids. And then she got pregnant. And something about that next year, I just kind of, like, started to shut down. And I felt like everything that I ever wanted in my life, wanted to do, was getting backseated not in a selfish way like oh i want my life whatever it just it wasn't going chronologically the way i needed it to go and i was, wasn't the smartest kid um almost fell out of high school did great in college but my brain kind of turned on when i was 19 somehow but before then I failed everything so i really can't getting off my program of how it's going to work i thought i'm going to fail at everything and uh and my I, I could not seem to kickstart my memory. So a friend of mine says, hey, we should go see a doctor. I was on Adderall, and I was like, oh, what's Adderall? Uh, no one, never in all my schooling had ever even mentioned anything. Just, you know, he's a dummy. I mean, that's really because <laughs> this is the, the 80s. And so uh, I took Adderall. My brain shot up like a rocket, and I was like, what in the heck did you just give me? And And at the time, this is back early 90s, Adderall was not the least expensive thing. Matter of fact, it was cheaper to get on the street than it was to get it from a prescription. So well, it hadn't gone generic yet yeah. like it is now. So, so you're like right. $500, very, I think. Very expensive, yeah. So you get on the street for like 300 for like a month, month's worth. Um, and a friend of mine one night said, he goes, oh, dude, it's way cheaper just to do cocaine. It's the same thing. Gave me this whole story of how cocaine and Adderall the same thing. Laid out this chemistry set. And I was like, really? I thought cocaine was... I thought at first you smoke weed and then you're robbing banks. I mean, that's the commercials, <laughs> they don't... Sell drugs for madness. Yeah, it's so dumb. They they need to change PSAs for drug and alcohol because they're not they're not telling the story properly. Um, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. So anyway, uh, so I said, okay, let me try it. It's cheaper, and by golly, it worked. You had to do it more often, and I think because I was always this fit kid, always in uh, athletics, etc. And I knew when I started to go be a comedian, if you want to be seen more, you need to be heavier. If you're a normal-looking white guy, you're going to get lost in everything. But if you're Hispanic, if you're black, if you're fat, oh, those are the guys that get more stage time than anybody. So I planned to put weight on. It was a I, conscious. Oh, yeah. I, I saw it work. I saw it work. People used to tell me on my mission, like, oh, you remember Chris Farley? I didn't know who he was yet because he came on while I was out there. And I came back. I'm like, my gosh, he reminds me of my brother. Like a, you know, my brother's thinner, but they act the same. And, and I was like, oh, that's it. John Canny, Belushi. The, if you're heavy and white, dude, it's you're you're set. That so, was your recipe. Yeah. So then that's kind of when I and, and when I went to a doctor once, he's like, and he just said, he goes, you have some things in your blood, and I knew him, so he did not report me, thank goodness. But he's like, I've never seen anybody ingest that much cocaine and gain weight. <laughs> and I was like, dude, I can eat steak all day long, man. And if you give me cocaine, I'm gonna eat more. And I don't know why, but apparently it's a it curves people's appetites, not mine. So I went from Adderall to cocaine within like a couple months, and then I was, and then I started, and no one knew this. My, my I, I had no this, idea, and no I thought we knew. were pretty good friends. Yeah, I, in fact, I was, the word cocaine in the 90s was not a word you wanted to use. Um, and so I think if you said I smoke weed, you're like, all right, cool, man. We smoke weed together or something. But uh, you use something harsher, and it really freaked people out. So, and to make you feel better, I was high as a kite. Uh, all a single word. Um, I I was on cocaine all day long and all night. So and I in fact I got the point where I had to smoke marijuana just to fall asleep. So I I, I kind of that's how I kind of got into it. But then I saw oh my gosh my brain's turned on. I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop reading. I couldn't stop learning. Couldn't stop memorizing. Couldn't stop anything. And I never wanted my brain to turn off. And I felt like my brain had got turned off. It's not really what it was. But I just turned it on full speed. But the problem is. You get immunity. And tolerance. Then, yeah, tolerance, not immunity. Were we in the 1800s? Okay. <laughs> yeah, hey, yeah. Immunity, my boy. Uh, <laughs> hang him. Anyway, the, I got tolerance, and so more, more, and more, and more. And I had kept it secret for so long, so I started selling it. No one, not even did they not know I didn't use, they had no idea I was selling it. That's how I was funding it. Yeah. 
I I could have looking back, I could have probably bought a boat, but <laughs> my addiction was pretty high. So you snorted um, a boat, yeah, which is so dumb. I shame on me for what I put my family through. But anyway, the uh, so that's how it kind of got started. And then I got into marijuana shortly after because my friend was like, oh, dude, I can't sleep either. But I started smoking weed. You can fall asleep. I was like, really? I don't know where he was. His weed was better because I've had really crappy weed. Not not to lighten what this is, but there is good and bad drugs of every kind. And I mean, like a baby, I could sleep. And I thought, great. I went from, okay, I grew up a good boy. I went on a mission, got married in the temple. Uh, and and I thought I was on this path or whatever. I am addicted to cocaine and now marijuana just to sleep. And I'm like, how did I get here? And I didn't feel bad. I didn't feel guilty necessarily. Because you were giving to people what you thought they wanted. Right, right, yeah. And you, I thought I was vaulting who I was, for sure. And I think that's a misconception for a lot of people in their drug use. This makes me stronger. This makes me be able to do more. I mean, there's a lot of moms that we've had from different counties here in Utah who got it just to keep up with everyday life, you know, right. being able to keep the house clean, take the kids here, do this. I mean, we've all got the same 24 hours, but sometimes people try to put a lot more into those 24 hours and your body just can't physically do that. Yeah, and it's it, it using uh, Speed of any kind, cocaine, Adderall, whatever, something to speed you up. The misconception is a person. Oh, I'm I'm at my best self. I'm learning the best. Oh, yeah. I'm really smart. You know, I'm, I've I've enhanced my brain, and uh, it's a lie because you know everyone else kind of sees or eventually will see you know, like now you're really not progressing. So it becomes this house of cards where you can't keep it up too long. Would you agree with that? Oh, for sure. In fact, it's ironic if you have ADD, which I had extreme ADD. Um, if you take too much of anything, you have worse ADD. I had, I had the worst ADD of my life on it. And at first it was helping because it was kind of being monitored. I, I really wish the doctor would explain Adderall better to me at that point. But it was such a – anyway. Well, and those were the early days of it being – abused so much and so i think now the medical establishment has caught up to where it's highly controlled all of the drugs in that class like adderall are highly controlled they're not easy to to get a prescription for when you do get a prescription um most i should say doctors or prescribers are going to really go over the details with you but back in those days it was you know whether it was painkillers or or adhd meds it was just kind of a here you go right yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, I was getting, <laughs> it's funny if anyone knows, 40 milligram. I, they don't even give you 40 milligram. It's 30 is the highest you can take. Yeah. I was getting a 40 milligram, and that'll light your fire <laughs> uh, in, inside your brain. But it, like anything, it comes off, and they say, you, do, you don't really, it doesn't really, it's not like a drug, you know. Yeah, it is. It's, it's literally like a drug. And then when it turns off, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa hey, hey, don't stop. Don't stop. What's going on, man? I, I got to get the fire going. And that was my biggest problem. Like, and I so couldn't the, stop that. And the fire. higher you get, the bigger the crash, right? Oh, yeah. And so when people, you know, uh, when it's properly administered for the right reasons and people stay within that, then then it's fine, honestly. But when you when you start abusing it and and you get higher and higher and your tolerance increases, so you need more and more. Oh, yeah. And you're using it like you're, you weren't living a healthy lifestyle either, right? Like you're no, not sleeping at no. night. You weren't he was eating. talking about putting weight on you know, was his plan. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so your body is just dying for you know some rest and health and and so your crashes were i imagine huge very yeah they were massive um and then yeah yeah. you're listening to project recovery we're listening to michael b talk about his uh road to recovery we're just about to see where it all turned around for him Welcome back to Project Recovery. Uh, we're listening to Michael B. Uh, you might know him from movies like Singles Ward, Church Ball, uh, RM, Home Teachers. Uh, he's been in a lot of stuff. What and was your first movie, though? It was uh, Mulholland Falls. It was yeah. my first movie. Yeah. They cut his line. It they was a sad, line. sad day. Uh, but he was uh, <laughs> talking to us about his addiction and where it all began. Uh, he's a return missionary. Married, four kids, doing all these movies, uh, needed a little help, so went to a doctor, got prescribed Adderall, found out that uh, Adderall was more 
was cheaper on the streets, got that, and then somebody convinced him that cocaine was the same thing as Adderall, and here you are living this life for how long? Oh, gosh. Fifteen years. Fifteen years. And what they say in the industry is running and gunning, just trying to keep everything afloat. And it's like that guy you'd see in the old movies where they'd have plates spinning on (laughs) on sticks, and you're just going around just trying to keep every plate from going, (laughs) right? That's a good analogy. I like that. I mean, that's yeah, kind of what you were doing because sure. I know that's what I was doing. If one was starting to wobble, it's like, oh, this one needs my attention for a little bit. Get that going. And the yeah. whole time, all these other plates are starting to fall. And then eventually, they all fall. When did uh, they all fall for you? They all fell. Uh, it would be uh, the last day of May to June 1st, um, 2008. And uh, so, uh, and I woke up in that field off Geneva Road, butt naked. And that's when it kind of— Wait, 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 wait. You woke up in a field off of Geneva Road, <laughs> butt naked. Yeah, butt naked. And were you still married at the time? I was. Um, in fact, it was pretty. I think my ex-wife probably hated me for the last several years, for probably. But did you blame um, her? Oh well, yeah, of course. Of course, I hated all women uh, due to my past life. But the, the uh, so I, I thought she could be a fix, like I wanted every woman to do, be a fix. Um, and did she know happen. about your drug abuse? Like, had no, she figured it out? No, but when she, when I did finally tell her that I was, I did tell her I was drinking. You should never do alcohol with cocaine ever. So kids out there, don't mix, please. Just don't do any yeah, of it. Don't, yeah, don't do any yeah. of it, but don't, <laughs> yeah. don't cocktail yourself out. Cause that's the stuff that gets really dangerous. And so, um, uh, they're all dangerous, but anyway, the, um, I kind of told her that I was drinking and it, I think she knew, but. It was kind of liberating to kind of tell her a little bit, and I and I didn't really talk about it much after that. We didn't really talk about it at all. Did you tell her in the hopes that she would ask you to stop or to try to fix you, or did you want to tell her to rub it in her face? No, I wanted to tell her to so that she would realize that it, this isn't about her, and I think all women you know will kind of put it on their own, on their own. Uh, well, it must be me, and I'm like, this has nothing to do with you at all, nothing to do with you. You're just a, a cog in the wheel of, of a long history of hate, and that was and that was a problem I had. So let, so let's go back. I mean, for the listeners, you you mentioned that in your past life, some things had happened that kind of made you realize later that you had a problem with women. Uh, yeah, can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, uh, when I was a young boy, right, right when I was around four, five, uh, there was a woman who started to molest me, and they lived uh, fairly close to us and. Tennessee, and that went on for about eight years. Eight years? Yeah. That's a really long time. It was a long time. I didn't think it was that long until I started going, I had the EMDR, and, and then I realized how long and how treacherous some of the things were. And that was something that we'll get to in a minute that yeah. happened in your um, in your recovery process, right. but EMDR is eye movement uh, desensitization and reprocessing. It's a type of therapy that's primarily used in in trauma, trying to help a person reprocess the experiences they had, and and so you were saying that you weren't really aware that that had happened for eight no, years. No, not then? not for eight years. Not even close. I knew it, things had happened, but I just kind of repressed them. Yeah, we yeah, had big time. I didn't believe in repressed memory. I thought, oh, a couple of things, whatever. It sounds kind of hokey. Let's be honest. A repressed <laughs> memory sounds kind of <laughs> hokey me, or like an excuse. It sounds yeah. convenient. Yeah, kind of you, like you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. That people say it's repressed because it's just convenient. That that well, I know what happened, you know what happens, but I just say it's repressed because then I don't have to deal with it. I don't have to think about it. But the yeah. reality is, you know, there are there are sensitive developmental periods, critical periods of development in our psyche and our our perception of ourself, our personality, and those are the years. You know, you said it started when you're four or five, went on yeah. for eight years. That's all all of that elementary school time, and yeah. and that it, those are the years when. We really are forming a sense of how we feel about ourselves and how we see the world. So uh, because of that trauma, it doesn't surprise me that, A, you, your brain tried to separate itself from what was happening and, and get away from thinking about that all the time. Yeah. Uh, if it happened for eight years, you must have felt to some degree out of control, like I can't stop this from happening. I'm just a kid. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I blame myself. I never blame my mother, which is funny because most people do blame parents because they didn't protect them. But the woman would always tell me that I would I'll cut your mom's head off. I'll, I'll kill your father. And so sleep. she threatened. And so yeah. there was a lot of that. And and those are things I kind of put aside. And throughout that, there was a couple men that got involved as well. 
Um, but people just assume like when you're a boy and a woman that it's just sex and it's, there's no violence, which is not true. Oh, no. So in, in it's the violent side that I just kind of put aside. And then when I kind of started, I, I kind of like would say things out loud kind of out of anger. Like I'd hear people make comments. I'm like, you have no idea what it feels like to be a, a little boy. And having your head slammed in the concrete and just everything shoved in everything you have. And then y- y- you have no one to share that with. You have no one that experienced that. It's hell. It's hell. So you, so it does sound like it's a convenient thing. But you realize there's not one ounce of that trauma anyone wants to hear. Ever. Because they immediately put it into themselves and into their own children. And I just, I told God, I can handle anything. Don't. Don't let that in my kids, please. Or I'll, I'll turn into a mass murderer. So I've been really fortunate in yeah. that aspect. But I, it, it's something, that I'm, I'm 49 this year. Not a day in my life does a memory not come to my head. Yeah. And. Well, but I know it's. I had to learn to forgive that, and it's a, it's something that you know we talk about a treatment for that, like EMDR, and but it's something that continues with you. You don't forget it, right? And the reason that uh, I think it's important to educate people on these situations, and thank you for doing that and talking about it so openly, is that it does happen to people, and if it's happened to you, reach out and get some help. Um, a child doesn't have the skill set or even the mental capacity to know how to handle that when it's happening to them. It, that's why it really isn't a child's fault for not saying anything. Um, we could talk about neurodevelopment and cognitive development and why, you know, at four, five, six, seven, ten, you didn't have the ability to even tell anybody about that. And you probably did fe- feel the fear of the threat. That's a, that's a common technique for the molester to use to threaten the child and and you believe adults even the the perpetrator and so as you grow up those are so horrific those memories just bringing them up now you're getting emotional and 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 so you repress it you put it away and that is a real thing so i I do want to validate you and other people out there who have gone through this that a repressed memory in that situation is not convenient it's a real process to try to continue on your own personal development and and kind of compartmentalize and put away that stuff but eventually it shapes part of how you think and feel and and as you said you feel like it it affected how you saw women as an adult oh yeah my whole life even when i was younger um i i, I couldn't i can't tell you how many it, like the the main ball players. I mean, I played sports. So I was really good. I was always super small, um, but they were always jerks to the girls. That was kind of like the thing in high school. I made out with all the girlfriends. No one knew because all the girls were like, oh, you're so sensitive. So kind of like, oh my gosh, you kiss way better than whatever. And I was like, cool, man. Well, I just did that to show you that I was had way more power than you, and I could take yeah. you from anything. And it's so dumb. I never let my. I was never a person that let looks or or that kind of thing. What I wore, what I drove to ever effect because i just never believed that i wasn't taught that way but i just i don't have low self-esteem at all but in reality i had the lowest self-esteem but on the outside it didn't appear so you were out there trying to steal guys girlfriends and control them just to prove you could do it which was again kind of a subconscious way of trying to regain control in a female relationship oh yeah 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 big time and so dumb Unbeknownst to you, uh, because of what happened to you, the trauma as a young child, it shaped the way you looked at women moving forward. And oh, yes. then you're married, you are got four kids, you're ending up, you know, hooked on cocaine, smoking weed to sleep at night. But you're a funny guy. Don't Thank you, you think that trauma <laughs> – you're welcome. <laughs> uh, don't you think that trauma affected – becoming a funny guy like like did like oh, always yeah. being yeah. funny like for sure Fat why why do you think you developed that um, side of yourself it was a good yourself. way to hide it was the same reason why I like drugs i felt so so high i felt like i had power over it well you do have power over when you make everybody laugh right oh yeah you can it's an amazing thing when you make someone laugh and it, the, it, their their guard comes down like so far and i i'll bring the biggest strongest dude and i will in a fun way, embarrass him on stage and make him as small as whatever. And it's cute and it's funny, but 
uh, I'm not afraid of anyone or anything. Uh, and but I lived in constant fear when I was younger. Constant. I feel like someone's on the back of my neck, about to hurt me, twenty four seven. And I had to get away from that. I had to walk away from that. And then when I started doing drugs and drinking, especially those together, I, I felt like I was unstoppable. And I guess in some ways I was. But the problem is that you you, you put something that you have to fix, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And years go on, and then it just breaks. And uh, if I don't take care of a car or anything, it's going to break. It's going to be ruined. And I didn't take care of my body and take care of my mind. But I thought... If I could just do all that stuff, no one would see it. No one would care. They'd see how strong I was. I don't know how many times Kurt would be like, dude, you're sweating, man. You're that hot. I was like, do you know it's like when you're heavy, just get hot faster in February? Just It's weird, you know? Like, <laughs> I'm sweating profusely. I got the I, February sweats, yeah, man. Like, you don't yeah, understand. Is a heater on? And I don't think they had – Kurt's such a sweet man. He's never – he's just – he and Dave, they're just good people. They, were, they're never, they weren't really partier people at all. So they, I don't think they picked up on any of the signs. They signed. wouldn't have known, right? Yeah. Yeah. Naive. Yeah. And Not- then George came in and started working with, with all of us. And I could tell George knew from the second he laid <laughs> <laughs> Some people can see right oh through you. Gosh. You're listening to the Project Recovery Podcast. We're listening to Michael B's story. We're going to find out about his rock bottom and what he's doing now. You're listening to Project Recovery, a KSL podcast. All right, welcome back to Project Recovery. Our guest today is Michael B., star of Singles Work, Home Teachers, RN, and Church Ball. <laughs> Did I get it right? Yeah, RM. RM. Did I say RN again? I don't know. It's okay. I wasn't really paying Lightning attention. Night I'm in a huge <laughs> in Provo right now. You don't even know. You're huge everywhere. And yeah. If you've laughed <laughs> as an LDS person in the 90s or early 2000s, you know Michael B. Yeah. That's right. And uh, <laughs> we're talking about your descent into addiction, but more importantly, your road to recovery. So we've talked about what brought you up to lying naked in a field off of Geneva Road. Yeah. What got you there? Gosh, I don't even know what I took that night, uh, to be honest with you. But I know I had a mixture of things. Um, and the week previous, uh, from talking to a friend, which I don't really remember, we're, we're doing acid as well. But uh, So I may have mixed it in there. Maybe that's why I blacked out. I, I, I can't believe I woke up. And uh, to be honest with you, and I, I, every morning when I wake up with my eyes, I think I'm awake. I'm alive. So there's more. Um, so whatever, I, I'm not sure exactly what I took completely, but when I got up, I I got dressed and went home to my ex-wife's house. And uh, and she's like, it's your son's birthday. Did you get him anything? And something about her saying that, something just like clicked in my head. Like, how in the hell did you get your 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 first son and you don't even know it's his birthday today and i uh, and he's such a cool kid he just got married two days ago he's just a cool kid he had long hair because he loved growing his hair out thick like a woman i thought he was a girl but he just beautiful hair and he was like it's okay if you don't give him anything as long as you're here so i uh obviously i went out and got nine million legos but the uh <laughs> uh I, I couldn't, the way he looked at me, I couldn't do it again. I, I couldn't do drugs anymore. And I, from that down, I never got drunk. I would drink lightly, and I worked my way for the next year. And so 2009, June 1st, I stopped drinking. But drugs, I couldn't do it anymore. So I went and checked myself into a hotel and said, I'm just going to detox. Didn't know what I was thinking. Don't ever detox alone. Please get medical help. Um, cause honestly, if I'd have gotten that hotel window open, I would have jumped out just to stop the pain. I bled out every hole in my body. I, I, it was the worst. When I hear people say I detox three times, like I, I, I could not do it a second time. I would keep myself from doing this. I now know why people are addicted. They don't want to go through that. That's, well, you know. It's no, hell. It's the, oh my we've God. heard so many people on the podcast go, I wasn't afraid of death. I was afraid of detoxing. And it makes sense. And so at that point, the attic brain takes over because you don't want to feel this pain anymore. You don't want to do this. And you know what will solve it. 
And so you need to detox around somebody who's going to help you. Hopefully a professional, you know, medical, you know, because there's so many things that could and can happen when doing so. So you detox in the hospital, in the hotel for how many days? Uh, About nine. And uh, when I, when I feel like I get up uh, and wash myself off from throw up and blood, I just, I just would lay around every day and I just, Kept over day after day, and no one really knew where I was. In fact, no one knew where I was, which is it was dumber. Uh, it was the stupidest thing ever. Um, anyway, so I I, I, I I need help, and I was working at the time with Mitch English um, uh, in uh, Orlando, Florida. So I would go out and I would work on some of these uh, on or off site. Um, I produce these little spots with them. And I started met up with Lighthouse, and I started meeting with them. And and I when I came here. I started meeting with the greenhouse, and uh, which their group therapy is phenomenal. And if anyone needs uh, a reference somewhere in Utah, the greenhouse, if for addictions especially and PTSD, it's hands down. Um, but the, uh, in my opinion, but anyway, the uh, it, that's really that was the very beginning. Was this? I, I got to the point to where I I didn't care about anyone ever, including my children, and I love my children. I've always loved my children. I, 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 that's the saving grace. So when I told you before off air, like, I wanted one child. I had one, and I was like, I'd have fifty. I I fell in love for the first time when I had kids. So um, it just kind of was this chain of events, and I was like, I, I I'm not sure how to do it. And I think I was telling you this case. It's so weird. So I for a couple of years, I was like, man, I, I I'm getting these craves like all the time. So I went, I went to uh, the greenhouse and said, man, I don't know what it is. Starts asking me questions. He goes, well, what was it like when you were partying? Okay, I did this, this, this. And I realized I was drinking two 64 ounce cups of Diet Coke every day. And mm-hmm. he's like, why don't you try not drinking Diet Coke for a week? Almost immediately they went away. And I was like, it was Diet Coke. <laughs> because I drank some Diet Coke. It was triggering something. I can drink Diet Coke now. Just fine. Well, it's a stimulant, it, right? You yeah. get cocaine. Yeah. So it's kind of a funny, weird connection. So I just did everything in my power to not. So I started going to 12-step programs. Anywhere I could, I would go sponsor anybody. I would go to anyone's program with them. Oh, you're going on Thursday night? I'll go with you. I would go to everything I, I possibly could. And I wanted, And it was the first time I was around a bunch of people who not were just admittant, but I was like, oh, my gosh, someone has the same problem I do from a far worse situation I've ever heard in my life, and some not. And they're so strong and so powerful. I'm like, how did you do that? I want to know how. How did, you were using ten times as much as me? I don't even know how they're alive. I know what it does to the body, and I was, and I was dumbfounded. And uh, and I wanted that. I want. I wanted to look back in time and go. Like, I didn't do it for a week. I didn't do it for a month. I didn't do it for three months, six months. And I really, honestly, I thought if I can do a year, I'll probably. Do some stuff. Then I can go like another year, and that's what I was thinking. And I had well, that's no what idea. the addict brain does. I mean, yeah, you, yeah, you're right. And I call it a test drive. I've seen so many people that I went through recovery with, and people that I know who get that time behind them a year, you know, three months or whatever, and they wonder if they can still take it out for a test drive. <laughs> and and they, then they, it, it never ends well. I can tell you that now. No. I've never met anybody who's been able to go back to it. And, and be able to do it like a gentleman, as they say. Drink like a gentleman or this. Oh, gosh. They're worse. I, I know because there are people I, I can't even be around. I, I had to tell people, I, I can't be around you ever. I love you, man. I cannot ever be around you in my life, ever. Because I will destroy my life if I'm around you. I can't say no around you for some reason. And there's some people that have that power over you. Yeah. So you started going to every AA meeting you could, going to yeah. sponsor whoever asked, uh, and and. In yeah. that time, you fell in love again. I did. <laughs> it's funny. I met my wife at a gas station. I'm not. I'm old school, man. I'm not meeting chicks online. This is not my thing. If I want to <laughs> look at their face and be like, yeah, they're not interested. I want to grinder no and whatever you know. Tinder, yeah, t- gas station. Did you uh, say yeah, grinder? I don't know why it popped in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even understand the whole concept of like Tinder, like swipe me. And then if a person, if I get this right, you say you like this picture, and if that person likes your picture. It matches you, right? Yeah, you got a connection. I've never been online. That's dating. the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> and then I got to go filter the bunch of chicks and like, no, yeah, like degrading a bunch of them. Like, I don't know what. It's, it's, what I look at is not what I like the most, anyway. Obviously, <laughs> uh, and what what I care about is how I feel. And I think before it was very much based around like the stereotypical when I was younger. But 
I can't feel a certain way. I need to feel connection. I need to feel love. I need to feel something. So we sat at a gas station and talked for hours, literally, in the in the in the parking lot, and it didn't even get her number. I was like, "There's no way we, we won't meet again." I've never so met. You, so you just like this. met her at a gas station, yeah. talked for hours, yeah, forgot to get her number. Yeah, at first she's like, <laughs> "Hey, you're the guy from the home teachers." I was like, "Come on, man, not don't do it." <laughs> not you too. Me. And uh, she's like, "It's weird. I literally just finished watching the movie." <laughs> and I come here, and you're standing here, and I was like, "What? That is weird." So we went out and we talked about everything. We ne- didn't want to talk about relationship stuff. Not once didn't ask if I was divorced. Didn't ask anything. We just talked about everything. So I was afraid because I know I've been divorced for a while, and I said, "Let's, uh, we'll run into the, run into each other again." I, I, there's no way. There's no way we wouldn't. And five months later, we did. And I have I haven't left her face since. I mean, it's and she is Fernanda Bum. Uh, owner of the Bone Boutique. Yeah, she and, yeah she and her sister. It's her maiden name, Bone. Yeah, and uh, things are going wonderful for you. Oh yeah, yeah. She's very influential. My my best friend Nate and uh, and my wife were uh, my my girlfriend at the time. Probably the most influential people on the earth for sure. I want to talk to you real quick before we let you go because sure. your situation it was similar to mine, being that you had. A certain amount of fame, being on TV and movies and radio and all that stuff, and when it all fell apart, how did that affect you? <laughs> well, number one, I realized that uh, I have no friends, um, and that all the people that quote unquote love me, they didn't care. No one visited me in jail. No one talked to me. No one texted me. No one called. One person texted me. It was the funniest thing. Dude, I don't care if you stole it or not. Whatever. Just uh, you can come to my house anytime. You're just fine. Dave Nibley. And Go we on. didn't really talk much about it because I was afraid because I always looked at him really highly. And so I was afraid to tell him stuff. But he was just, it was like the nicest text. And, uh, but um, my, my buddy, I was going to go into a bar one night. And he's like, do not go in that bar. I was like, I can't take it. And I was, I've been dating my girlfriend for a couple of years. who's not my wife. And I was like, I can't, I can't do it. I'm so stressed. I know if I just drink just a little, it'll go away. And I sat in the car outside of a bar downtown Salt Lake. And he's like, please. And he he goes, just answer my phone call. I'm like, I can't. I don't want to hear his voice because he'd love me too much. And uh, <laughs> and I fell asleep. And at four in the morning, I woke up and there's a million texts I miss. And you know when you start to text somebody and their bubble comes up because. Second I texted, you see that bubble coming up? And he just sat there by his phone until I woke up. I was that whatever you did, uh, I fell asleep. And uh, and I've never had that drive to go sit in front of a bar ever since. And that was that, that's what really what changed my life. And I was really fortunate that when, when I recovered, I realized I could create a friendship with a person that's true and honest and full of light. And everything I'd done before, it's not that we weren't friends. There was zero depth. Nothing. I don't care. I care if it's good. If it's good, you want to give me that party? You're my best friend. Uh, you need a ride home? Hell no. Uh, I can't get, well, probably most of them couldn't give me a ride home anyway because they're drunk. But but anyway, it, it, it was, I needed all that. I needed love. I needed life. I needed light. I needed all that. And I didn't think it was available. I didn't think I deserved it. I didn't think that I could earn it. And uh, and that's really changed my life. My my wife really kind of watched me kind of go through this whole process. My kids watched me change from being this idiot in jail to who I am now, and which I thought was going to ruin their lives, and it did not ruin their lives. Th- thank goodness. You know what, Matt? It, uh, we've said it a, a hundred times on the podcast, and I think that's what Michael B. found. What's the opposite of addiction? It's connection every time. And, uh, it's, you know, most people think the opposite of addiction is not doing it, but it's not. It's connection. It's finding somebody who sees you for who you are and is accepting, loving, and wants nothing but good things to happen for you. And it sounds like you found that in your wife. And it sounds like you found that in some of your friends now. Yes. Yeah, thank goodness. Because I, if, for a long time, I, in fact, it's kind of funny. When City Weekly did this big paper the story on me, and I didn't ask them to do a story on me. For some reason, they threw in a story because they thought it's so weird. This Michael B was this Mormon guy, and then he, he gets excommunicated. He's not, and he's going to go join again because you know the City Weekly is an anti-Mormon paper, and there, this guy was just thought it was fascinating that I wanted to, and I was like, and it took me years to go back and do that. And I was, and so a friend of mine said, "You should talk to him. He's pretty open." 
you don't have to just do a story because it may not be all true. Thank goodness because he would have made the bad stuff way worse and the good stuff not even close. So we did this story or whatever, and I, I didn't want my daughters or my mother to read this crap. I, I, I kind of I did not want to do it. He's going to do the thing anyway. He's going to write it out anyway. But in becoming this kind of eye-opening, and they said, give me names of friends, people you work with, people you don't, don't like you. And I put Darren Tufts as a person that doesn't like me. Because I never thought he liked me. He's the quest guy. Yeah, quest guy. And oh, I always okay. loved Darren. Yeah, yeah. I, let me just say that. I loved Darren, but I thought he didn't like me. I thought, I don't know what he thought about me. Anyway, that thing came out. And he's like, hey, I, I think you're one of the greatest <laughs> dudes, man. I had no, I felt so bad. And I become closer friends because of that. I thought, I don't know why I thought, my brain didn't work, man. I was, I could not see reality when I was addicted. I, that's the worst part is that you're not living in reality. And that becomes your new reality. And when you take all that stuff out, you're like, my gosh, this is a beautiful place without all that crap. And I don't have to be controlled. And I, I can go out my day without, you know, quote, unquote, help to get my day going. I don't care if I'm tired. I don't care how tired or exhausted or my brain doesn't work, whatever. I, I'm not going to fault to that life again. I can't. I, 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 I won't. I, I guess I can. Let me rephrase that. Anybody can, but I won't. And it's work every day. And I think I think you're bringing up a great point. I want to throw this out there and see what you think. That you know you've mentioned that when you were in the throes of your addiction, using for all those years, and you thought you had all these friends, people that you partied with and and worked with and whatever, and then you got into jail and and you you really didn't have anybody visit. You start to feel really lonely. But part of that is you use the word superficial, and I think that when a person doesn't, you're not good with yourself. Like when you haven't, we haven't processed what all of us need to process, whatever our traumas are. When you're masking who you really are with drugs and alcohol, then you only create superficial relationships. And I think a lot of people get resentful that nobody shows up for them, but that it sounds to me like you've had the, the other side of the experience, which is once you got clean and sober, once you started to work through your own stuff and become the genuine version of who Michael B. is, all of a sudden you realize, oh, man, there are people there. That, and I can make a genuine connection. It doesn't have to be this superficial stuff. And people start showing up for you like you start showing up for them. And and would you say that's the process? Yeah. Be because I think a lot of people, like in that in-between stage, they get resentful. Nobody showed up for me. And, and it's not until they realize I've got to do my own work that the the true friendships either develop or become apparent. Yeah, in fact, the greatest thing that ever happened to me was taking it all on the jaw. Uh, I got put in jail for something I wasn't guilty of. It doesn't matter. I'm guilty of a million things I could be put in jail for. But it doesn't matter. Um, losing everything, losing my family, all these things now I look back and think, I, if, I would have never faced it. I, I, and everything would have continued to be superficial. And I realized, well, really no one does give a damn about me. But then I finally realized people are afraid and they tell me that. I was afraid to be around you, man. I'm afraid of what you do or say. And I and I finally took on that responsibility, which is was hard because I want to point a finger. I want to blame somebody. I want to blame that woman. But I have to forgive her. I have to forgive everyone around me. I have to forgive myself. And when I did all that, all of a sudden I started seeing more clearly. And I realized I don't know if I ever took anything on the chin before, ever. I blamed everything for everything on someone else. And it Everything in my life, I'll I'll take, uh, I, and and I'm able to take it, and and that's I, that's the difference yeah. between superficial and authentic. And you know, being an authentic person means you deal with what what's what's yours to deal with. You and, took ownership. Uh, yeah, take ownership. Yeah, right. It's hard. I didn't. I wasn't doing anything for myself. And uh, then when I got clean, all of a sudden people feel more comfortable. And it's ironic now, whenever something really treacherous, I'm sure this happens to you, emotional, physical, spiritual, drugs, whatever, the first person they go to is me. Hey, I'm feeling way lost. Like, And then sometimes I'm like, I have no experience. Now. Like, Holy crap. Like, I, I can't even imagine what that's like. But they feel more comfortable because they think I'm not, I'm not going to judge them. But I can tell you right now, for all you have to have family and friends or whomever, do not judge those people. You have to love them no matter what because one day they're they're going to turn a corner and they need to go back to love. 
And uh, and unfortunately, I did not have a lot of love to go back to. Uh, but th- there were some, and then it developed and more and more. And because you're going to be a person, everyone's going to go to. And th- I'm sure that happens to you. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't think I'd ever be doing a podcast on recovery. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that for sure. But I'm so happy and happy and grateful that I am. And I've learned so much, and I've learned so much from listening to your story and so much doing this podcast. So I want to say thank you for sharing your story because I know you don't have to do this. And the fact that you're willing to do this is going to help so many people out there because what we are is giving people hope that they can turn that corner, that their life can be better. I always tell people right now, it's not a fun road. It's not an easy road. And uh, it only works if you work. And that's the only way to get it. And so if I can talk to people, I'll stop. I will answer the phone. I will answer emails, Facebook, whatever you've got. If I can help, I want to give it back because when I need it, somebody gave it to me. And so that's what I want to do. Same. That's good of you to do that. Dr. Matt, anything? I just really appreciate it, Michael B. Um, I I think that... You know, I love being in in the industry I'm in, uh, industry, I don't know, healthcare. You know, I love helping people. I love my job. But a person like you and Casey have touched people in a different way and have a lot of influence. And I hope, I know that people listening to your story are going to be inspired by that. I think, I hope they take away the idea of being authentic. How can I be a more authentic person? Because authenticity leads to uh, real relationships and love. I think that's another great takeaway is that love really does conquer all. It sometimes takes a while, but that's what, what we need in order to, to find that connection with, with our family and our friends. And so I thank you so much because I know there are people listening who needed to hear that message today. And they're like, man, if that funny, happy guy from, <laughs> from the silly Mormon movies could go through all of that and be where he's at today, maybe I can do that too. Yeah, and they can. It, it is... <laughs> I know it's like to feel like it's not possible, and it's possible. It, you can do anything you put your mind in. You're right. Every time you say you put the work in, it's the one thing I didn't want to do. Put the work in. Nobody when, does. Yeah. I, gosh. When you're done, you're like, thank goodness I put the work in. Yeah. You, you don't get it till after it's done. Right. I'm going to leave you with this because I hear it a lot in the recovery world. Love the person, hate the disease. And sometimes it's hard to to distinguish between the two but really the person needs love and it's okay to hate the disease because i know i do hey you're listening to project recovery a ksl podcast brought to you by use only as directed.org with a three-part solution speak out opt out and of course throw out of this program are for informational purposes only. The program is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, licensed therapist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this program. KSL does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, physicians, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on the program. Reliance on any information provided on the program is solely at your own risk.